Good morning, everybody. With us today is Elson Solberg. Is everybody ready to learn more about than what 90% of the agronomists out there don't? I know I am. Take it away, Elson. All right, well, good morning, everybody. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here with you again. Uh, we had a glitchy day last week, and it uh, looks like everything's under control in this, well, this part of the world's under control in this uh, politically correct, self-isolating world. And I'm gonna talk to you a little bit about uh, uh, a few things that I've learned from Dr. Ishmael Chakmak, I guess maybe relearned and, uh, and then connect some dots between, uh, with, between boron and sulfur and why they're so absolutely critical in crop production, especially for growers who are attempting to ever increase their yields and their quality and, and their profitability. And for whatever reason, I might be a bit of a slow learner, but some of this stuff um, really hammered home to me when I uh, hung out with, with, with Ishmael a few months ago in Saskatoon um, and had a lot of different conversations and then watched a couple of his presentations and then connected some dots that I'm sure some of you may have already connected. I see there's some pretty high powered folks on the call. So what I'm saying is it all starts with boron and it all and sulfur. And um, I'm hoping that with it, over the course of the next 35, 40 minutes and then followed up with questions. And I think the host is okay with the questions coming during the presentation, um, we'll have a good conversation and hit some of the high spots of uh, some of the information that I either relearned or learned for the first time and, and see if it all kind of makes sense. So, like I say in most of my presentations that I do like this is that there's my email, there's my uh, phone number. I respond pretty well to emails, better probably to texts not at all to phone calls uh, on average unless um, unless there's a fire burning or something like that but uh, please don't hesitate to get in touch with me i'll have this information at the end of the presentation um, when we're finished so you don't have to frantically write it down and i think it's be this whole thing is being recorded so uh, no panic now i want to talk about a couple of things when it comes to boron and sulfur and uh, the thing that popped into my head when I began to connect the dots was the concept of cascading. And what I mean by cascading, much like the image that's on the screen, is that something gets started and it accelerates a whole bunch of other things. So when it comes to um, boron, there's a number of things that uh, became self-evident when I listened to Ishmael took a lot of notes, reviewed his slides, um, and just, you know, bore down on the information that he was sharing. He, he probably talked during his presentations for two and a half hours, and I had the privilege of hanging out with him the night before over dinner, and he and I sat at one end of the table and, and drank fine wine while the rest of the people got juiced up. and. Uh, we, we talked about a lot of things agronomic, but when it comes to boron, one of the very first functions of boron is that it drives roots. Uh, we all know that it's critical for pollination and cell differentiation, and most of us know that it's important for driving roots, but um, I hope the imp importance of this early driving of roots will come home because this is where the cascading effect begins. So we're very early in, in a crop's life, and it doesn't really matter what the crop is. Obviously, uh, a crop like canola has a much higher requirement for boron than does cereals, but they all have a significant requirement. Boron and iron are the king and queen of micronutrients. They, the, the amount of those two nutrients that a crop needs dwarfs all of the other micronutrients. So the early function is to drive roots. And when you drive those early roots, um, in his work, the, the roots were able to take up as much as six-fold more potassium. And the interesting thing is that when a plant takes up potassium, the efficiency of the uptake of nitrate nitrogen also goes up. So I'm looking at a lot of uh, soil tests here the last few weeks 
and there's a lot of fields with a lot of nitrate nitrogen in them. So you're going to drive early roots, you're going to increase potassium uptake quite substantially in some cases and as a side effect of that your nitrogen uptake is also improved. What he also showed with research was um, specific research all referenced and everything else. Phosphorus uptake can be as much as two, two X. And of course we all know in Western Canada and the Western Northern States that the primary thing we're fighting um, early in the spring is cold and wet and slow root growth and all that kind of stuff. So the cascade be continues. He also showed that calcium uptake is improved by about one and a half times. And we know the relationship between calcium and boron is very, very strong, mainly because they're both involved in cell wall uh, creation. And the, the, the tighter the boron to calcium ratio, the more impervious those cell walls are to uh, pests of all kinds. And then uh, the next things that he's working on, he's trying to quantify the amount of increase there is for other nutrients like magnesium, which is also involved in root development, sulfur and micronutrients. And the early notes or the early observations are that uh, those are increasing as well. And, and he's no doubt got graduate students uh, working around the clock trying to quantify that. So that's boron. Early roots increase potassium significantly. Tag along is nitrate nitrogen. Increase phosphorus significantly. Calcium and then these other guys come along as the root mass is in the root interface with the soil is increased. So that's boron. And then we get over to sulfur. And he didn't talk a whole lot about sulfur, but he, he sort of did towards the end of his second talk. And it's kind of funny. Um, uh, most of the time I'm trying to keep up to him and uh, when it comes to the sulfur case uh, part of the puzzle uh, it looks like he's trying to get caught up to us and expand that dramatically so maybe our conversations are great and what we've learned uh, over the last number of years working with elevated levels of uh, soil applied sulfur so whether it's Tiger 90, Keg River 90, Biosol um, anything that's applied in large amounts, the, especially with the biosol, and soon to be released replenished. Um, when we put on large amounts of sulfur to the soil, the plants tend to take elevated levels of sulfur up. Plants will only take up so much sulfur. Uh, you can't really overdo it in terms of the plant nutritional availability. Um, and so when that happens, <clears throat> again, we're cascading. We have an increase in methionine and cysteine, and those are amino acids, and those amino acids um, are sulfur-based, and they actually kind of uh, are the gatekeepers to the production of all of the other amino acids. So that's the first cascade. And when all of when the plant is loaded with sulfur, it also creates molecules like phytoalexins and glutathione, and those are internal stress fighters that. Um, the plants used to ward off uh, all kinds of stresses. In fact, in humans and animals, glutathione is a very powerful uh, stress fighter. And then the one of the interesting things that I've relearned in the last little while is when a plant is loaded with sulfur, it converts some of that sulfate sulfur back into elemental sulfur. And that elemental sulfur almost acts like a plant antibiotic. And uh, if you think about it, many of the antibiotics that are out there for humans and animals are based on sulfur. Uh, the very first ones were and many of the ones in, in today's world still are. And so what you end up in this cascading effect is the plant takes up a bunch of sulfur. There's high levels in the plant. The plant then converts a lot of that uh, sulfur into methionine and cysteine which makes the creation of amino acids and proteins and everything else, uh, messaging systems in the plant accelerate. Uh, the high levels of sulfur then turn into phytoalexins, glutathione, and get converted back to elemental sulfur. So you have mu multiple layers of efficiency and, and stress uh, fighting here. And then what uh, Ishmael taught everybody that day is that when you have high levels of cysteine, it works in conjunction with ABBA, which is a growth hormone, not the band, but a growth hormone. 
that uh, ultimately control stomata with some impact from potassium, but his research tends to show that cysteine is actually the controller of stomata. So what that means is that if you have high levels of cysteine in the system and you, you're entering a drought uh, situations, your a drought situation, your root system sends a signal through with the aid of ABBA to the leaves and then the cysteine in, in the stomata uh, are able to react to that signal very, very rapidly and close off those stomata so that the plant can handle that drought stress period. And so we got cascading going on over here with boron, we got cascading going on over here with sulfur, and of course these two key nutrients are interacting with a whole bunch of other nutrients, sulfur in particular, um, when the, when the elevated sulfur in, in the plant is there, that elevated sulfur also enhances uh, the effect of all of the other nutrients. And I think I'll be talking about that later in this presentation. So um, one of the things that I want to be clear about too, and that is when it comes to soil sampling, um, sulfate and boron are difficult to be determined deficient in the field simply because both of those nutrients along with nitrate, nitrogen, and chloride, and molybdenum, so there's only five nutrients that are mobile in the soil, those nutrients tend to be extremely variable across landscapes, especially sulfur and boron. And so um, our heavy reliance on soil testing to determine whether or not we have sulfur or boron deficiencies, uh, I've thrown that out of the window a long, long, long time ago, except in the case where you consistently get low numbers um, with either one of these mobile nutrients and one of the things that we coined years ago, um, if the numbers are low, just go. In other words, if, you're, if you've got low soil test values and to depth with sulfate or with boron, after you know a couple, three years of soil testing, then trust those numbers. And if it's high, ask why. And the why is usually because of this variability up here. And this graph just <clears throat> is uh, you know, designed to show some of the uh, ways that folks will think about variability in fields. <clears throat> I don't know how many people are on the call, but let's say there's 50 people in the call and we think of this virtual call as a field. Um, I see Brent Tarasov's on the call. Brent Tarasov could be standing on 5,000 parts per million of sulfur and 10 parts per million of boron while the rest of us are standing on 10 parts per million of sulfur and uh, 0.2 parts per million of boron, Brent, Brent's result is skewing the result from all of the rest of us, and that's where you get the high, high variability across fields. So I hope that kind of makes sense. I um, wanna talk really briefly about this book. A lot of the stuff that I've been relearning is, has been coming out of this book published in 2007. It's been a bestseller ever since. Dr. Evans and I contributed to the chapter on copper. I'm rereading this thing for the fourth time and every time I read it, I learn some, relearn something new. And uh, I think there's a lot of value in here uh, in terms of what it is that I'm gonna try to talk, to talk about here in a minute. One of the things I learned by rereading this book the third time, and maybe it's just because I'm a slow learner, is that if we rank all of the nutrients that a plant needs and we assign a value of one to molybdenum and nickel because that's the, those are the two nutrients that a plant needs in the lowest amount, then we can rank everything relative to those guys. And so what we've learned, or I already learned from the book is that uh, when we talk about micronutrients, boron and iron blow everybody else out of the water. Manganese is, you know, close. But those two are by far the most important. Boron and canola should be like a 4,000. Iron and soybean should be like a 4,000. And so when we talk about micronutrients, there's quite a large discrepancy between um, the amount that's required by most plants. And then, of course, when we get into specific plants, uh, the, the difference is even greater. And that was a bit of uh, an awakening for me, uh, you know, pretty late in, in my my career, I've been at this for a long time. And then of course, we've got all of the other major elemental nutrients, 
And most people will tell you nitrogen is the most required, followed by potassium and then phosphorus and sulfur. In actual fact, calcium is the third most required uh, nutrient, followed by magnesium and then phosphorus and sulfur. And, you know, we have, we have different situations. Potatoes, uh, potassium is number one, nitrogen is number two. Oats, potassium is number one, and nitrogen is number two. So you have to keep some of that stuff in mind. But in, in most crops in general, calcium and magnesium are the third and fourth most important nutrients. And again, there's a really strong relationship between calcium and boron, uh, mainly because of the cell walls and, and all of that good stuff. And then up here, we've got the nutrients that are coming from water and from the atmosphere. And they obviously dwarf everything. And so I think when we, when we talk about how, how the plants are, are ranked, the nutrients are ranked, um, it, seems, it seems bloody obvious to me, especially for the younger agronomists in the crowd, we should, we should be spending a lot more time here and a lot more time here. Um, and when we spend a lot more time here and a lot more time here, these numbers get more efficient. And I think at the end of the day, uh, that's pretty important. So it all ends back to this teeter-totter of nutrient uh, balance and availability. And we've got the mobile nutrients over here and the immobile nutrients over here and the micro-micronutrients up here. Um, and that's all balanced on a teeter-totter of water. And our first job is to grow roots. And remember, boron drives early roots. And when we have early roots, we have early shoots, early solar panels. And this is really the whole thing that we're trying to manage. And so we all know about the four R's of nitrogen management. Uh, we've been lambasted with that forever. Um, I totally agree with the four R's, except there's a fifth R that's even more important than the four R's, and that is the right balance. So you got the right form, the right placement, the right time, and the right whatever, whatever I'm missing. We need the other R, and that's the right balance. So in other words, you can, you can do all of the four R's with nitrogen, but if you're super deficient in sulfur or you're super deficient in boron or any one of these guys you don't have the right balance, you don't get the right result. I hope that makes sense. When we're looking at tissue samples, and I can't over uh, encourage you folks to begin, if you're not tissue sampling on a regular basis, and especially if you're not tissue sampling multiple times per year, this is the first ratio we need to nail down, the nitrogen to sulfur ratio. And then the second ratio we need to nail down is the N to K ratio. So when you're looking at your tissue tests after this awe-inspiring presentation, have a look at those ratios. And then the third ratio, there's lots of ratios, is the calcium to boron ratio. Once we get the N to S ratio in line, and then the N to K ratio in line, the whole system becomes more balanced and more able to, to fight off all kinds of stuff. And then when we get boron to calcium in line, uh, the whole thing is like a rocket ship. Um, why, I'm pretty sure you guys all know what this is. This is the Mulder chart. And uh, for some reason, I never met, noticed for many years that there's a, there's a nutrient in there that's not uh, mentioned and that's sulfur. And the reason it's not mentioned is because sulfur enhances pretty much all of the other nutrients. So in other words, again, if your plant is loaded with sulfur, it's going to enhance the utilization of all of these other guys. That's the message you should take home. And the reason the, the uh, technical or fine detail reason is this. Here we have the 20 amino acids that create proteins. There's two amino acids, cysteine and methionine, that are the gatekeepers to the production of all of these amino acids that create proteins, plus about three other, 300 other amino acids that do signaling and everything else in plants. When a plant is low on sulfur, it's low on these two sulfur-based amino acids. When the system is low on these two sulfur-based amino acids, the production of these guys, and all of the other messenger uh, amino acids is not efficient and you end up with an un unbalanced system. So at the end of the day, 
The sulfur amino acids are ultra important because they are the gatekeeper to all of these and a whole bunch more that create proteins and ultimately money that you stick in your pocket. So that's kind of the technical version of why sulfur is so important. But forget all that shit and just remember these ratios. So for canola, canola plant des desires one pound of sulfur, so it needs to take up one pound of sulfur for every six pounds of sulfur that it takes up. Pulses is eight to one, cereals is 10 to one, corn would be in here, hay would be in here as well. These N numbers are the amount of nitrogen that's required to grow the yield goal. It's not the fertilizer nitrogen number. It's the amount of nitrogen that's required to grow the yield goal. So if you're trying to grow 60 bushels of canola, 60 times 3.3 is roughly 200 pounds. Divide 200 by six and there's your sulfur requirement. And in some cases, your sulfur um, recommendation. So when you're thinking like plants, um, I think tissues are the way to go. No, I don't think, I know they're the way to go and I'm currently trying to talk uh, a large number of agronomists and farmers into shifting their analytical budgets from soil testing, especially if they've got a foundation of soil tests to ever more and more tissue tests because just like a, uh, a soil test is like a physical, um, you know, old guys like me are supposed to be getting physicals on a regular basis. I'm usually pretty good on the physical without, you know, with the exception of being too chubby. Um, but where the rubber hits the road is when the doctor starts looking at my blood sample or tissue sample. And it's the blood sample or tissue sample that tells her as a doctor or you as an agronomist or farmer what that plant has been experiencing in the past, what's experiencing now, and what you can expect for the future. So um, to me, it, the tissue tests are way more powerful than the, than the soil tests in a lot of cases. And again, I've already said that the three critical ratios that I look at in all tissue samples, especially when I'm cross-referencing and stuff, is the nitrogen to sulfur because of the amino acids that I already talked about. The N decay because of the water management, and oh, it turns out that the sulfur uh, number is pretty important when it comes to the water management because of the stomatic control through cysteine, which is a result of high sulfur levels. And then the calcium to boron uh, ratio, early roots, strong cell walls, and then poll pollination. Um, those are the first three. There's a lot of ratios there. Don't get confused by them. Focus in on these first three. A lot of guys got this puppy nailed down. The odd guy has this one nailed down and very few have this one nailed down. So have a look at your tissues if you got them. So again, I've said this repeatedly in this book, when plant sulfur is high, phytoalexins are high, glutathione are high, sulfate in the plant gets converted back to elemental sulfur inside the plant. And when, this, when sulfur is high, cysteine uh, levels are high and they help the plant control stomata with a uh, hormone called ABBA. <clears throat> in that book, in, whoops, here we go. In this book, um, two chapters, so the whole concept behind this book was each chapter was written on a specific nutrient and then analyzed to see uh, whether that nutrient elevated disease or diminished diseases. And uh, depending on the nutrient, there's, you know, it's, it's uh, the teeter-totter is this way or the teeter-totter is that way. Sulfur and zinc are pretty much tied for uh, positive impacts on disease. And, you know, this is just one example. And the reason I've got it here, there's club root. And so one of the things that we've known for a long time is that the club root incidence or degree of, in of infection is somewhat diminished if you've got really good sulfur levels in, in your crop and you can see a bunch more and they, the table actually goes on and on and on. Down here, the, uh, when they did this research years ago, you know, it's called rape, it's now canola, so you can see quite a few, quite a few diseases that are diminished by high levels of sulfur. So again, you know, just some more stuff about the cascading effect of, of high levels of sulfur. This was cool. Uh, this came from Chuck Mack when I visited with him 
um, in Saskatoon, and this really, in one picture, tells a, a really cool story. You see the reference down here at the bottom? It's actually available on the internet if you get to the right site for free. Um, and for some of the geeks in the crowd, it's pretty good re reading. The whole concept here was they took, these researchers took different leaves from different plants and infected them with three different and probably more diseases. Um, and then charted the difference between plants that had adequate sulfur versus plants that had low sulfur. And it actually goes into naturally a lot more detail than what this picture represents. But um, pretty powerful, uh, you know, sulfur helps fight disease uh, is, is the basic uh, bottom line conclusion here. And so by now, I've been throwing the stuff at you a little bit quickly, and uh, I've sort of been repeating myself, but I want to shift gears a little bit and uh, get on to the next part of the presentation. And I want to talk about biosol, um, and basically biosol is a uh, very simple product that's comprised of 70% nutrimental or elemental sulfur that has various particle sizes and it's co-composted with 30% compost. And so what you end up with is a composted nutrimental or elemental sulfur product that has a wide range of particle sizes of elemental sulfur within it, everything from one micron to perhaps 4,000 microns. And uh, the compost is loaded with organisms that, that aid in the breakdown of the nutrimental sulfur to sulfate sulfur, which is the plant available form of sulfur. And the whole concept behind this product has been over the last six or seven years is that you get fields with 200 to 300 pounds per acre. Some whack jobs are even going as high as 400 pounds. And what happens is you have enough sulfur in the system. Remember it's 70%, guaranteed 70% uh, sulfur. You end up with enough sulfur in the system to last four or five six seasons, depending on the yields and the rotation and all of that sort of stuff. So it's one of the um, no brainer agronomic products on the market that uh, also has a really good logistical fit and a really good agronomic fit because every crop needs sulfur every year. And uh, it's got a sister product that will be coming out here in the near future. It's called Replenish, which has a uh, analysis, of, analysis of 0, 017, 0, 012. So it's 17% phosphate as rock phosphate, micronized rock phosphate, and 12% sulfur is micronized nutrimental sulfur. And uh, it's showing a lot of promise, and I'm not going to talk about that today, but just thought I'd plant that seed. So what I want to share with you is uh, an experience I had recently where I was looking at about 247 field scale biosol trials. So we had, there were trials out there scattered all over the place in 2018 and 2019. These were all third party things. All I did was look at the, the fast volume of tissue data. And, um, and so these trials were either in the first, second, third, fourth, or fifth year of, of the, after the initial application, and there was multiple crops. And, and I was having a hard time figuring out uh, how to sort of boil this all down to something useful. And then it occurred to me that I should just use um, the deficiency ratings or the sufficiency ratings from the lab. And uh, just about all of the samples were sent to ANL lab. So out of the 247 fields, again, multiple crops and multiple years after the time of application, one field was low in sulfur. So I think with that, you can safely assume that that eh, biosol works. But here's where it got kinky and weird and geeky. 57% of the fields, many of which had high levels of soil potassium, 57% of the fields were deficient in K. 51% were deficient in boron, again, despite the fact that many fields were sufficient or higher in, the, in boron. And of all of the other nutrients, all of the other nutrients that were important, and we've talked about on the teeter-totter, 4 to 13% of every other one was deficient in the plant. 
So my take on conclusion, conclusions are BioSol works. There's no doubt about it. Um, you know, there's literally thousands of these kind of comparisons now over the last six and seven years. Um, and maybe the fact that it's working is express, allowing the plants to express other fish that we shouldn't be frying. Or maybe for some of us, when, we're, when we put out large amounts of biosol or competitors and we don't see a dramatic uh, yield response, maybe we're not seeing that response because there's a whole lot of other stuff on that teeter-totter that we should be thinking about. So I thought this, for me personally, was a really par powerful experience. Here's some stuff from Matt Gosling. This is about 5,000 soil samples over a course of many years. And what Matt and his guys have been doing over that period of years, in the early days, they were putting on an annual applications of ammonium sulfate because they realized that every crop requires sulfur every year. And what we're looking at is, in the with the red line, is um, the amount of sulfur that was found in the soil each over the course of those years with the various numbers of soil tests. Finally, after talking to him about uh, using nutrimental sulfur for uh, that full first six years, because uh, we had learned a long time ago that nutrimental sulfur was the way to go if it was managed appropriately, they switched to Tiger 90 and you can see the, the numbers, the soil test numbers going up. And then in 2014, they were one of the first guinea pigs, them and uh, Brent Tarasov, uh, were some of the very first guinea pigs when it came to biosol and whammo, the numbers take off. And yeah, there's some variability and you would expect that, but with 5,000 soil samples, that's probably the largest database when it comes to a single product out there. It's pretty hard to argue with the results. Um, while they were doing this, in about 2008, they started taking tissue samples. So there's over 3,200 tissue samples here. And again, it's the same distribution. We've got AMS in the early days, AMS every year on every crop because every crop needs sulfur every year. The Tiger 90 program, 100, 110 pounds of Tiger every three years. Good program. Um, I helped, helped them a little bit back in May, actually, quite a bit before this. And then uh, the conversion to Biosol, and the main thing you want to look at is the shift from red and yellow bars to green bars. Um, peas are a little bit of an exception, but again, 3,200 tissue samples, 5,000 soil samples, it's the biggest database uh, for one given situation that there is. Uh, other folks like Terry Eberhardt in Langenberg, Saskatchewan, he's got uh, hundreds and hundreds of soil tests and hundreds and hundreds of tissue tests. Same, same uh, result out there. He's working with more topography and some salinity, so the variability is a little higher, but the exact same trends. And so at the end of the day, um, I think it's pretty hard for people to say that biosol isn't kicking, uh, kicking some serious butt. So now on to learning, unlearning, and relearning. And I uh, just want to restate some of the stuff that I've learned from this guy. This is Ishmael Chakmak. He is the best plant physiologist on the face of the earth and how he and I collided and have become friends is uh, beyond me. But uh, smart, smart guy and every time I have a chance to hang out with him I do. And if you guys ever have a chance to hang out with him, uh, please take that opportunity. He's very humble, he's very friendly, and he's exceptionally smart. And so I'm I don't think there's any point in doing all of this again, except I did forget one thing, and that is right here. You know, the, the whole cascading drives early roots, increases all this stuff, increases nitrate. But what he's what he has learned in his research is that if you have boron, adequate boron, and for whatever reason it becomes deficient, root growth stops immediately, as in instantaneously, and the potassium leaks back into the rhizosphere. And so we know with our growing conditions, especially because a lot of us are so reliant on the release of boron from organic matter, that when things get dry, there's intermittent uh, deficiencies in the system. And so you have this, the root system growing and stopping and then growing and then stopping. And there's 
these fluxes going on in the root, in the root system that kind of make make things uh, difficult for the plant. So bottom line, take home from this from this is get some boron in, on in the system so that the plant doesn't get deficient and the potassium doesn't leak back into the rhizosphere and the roots don't stop growing. Calcium and boron are mostly in the cell walls, about 90% of the borons in the cell walls and 50% of the calcium is. And um, that's, you know, that's why the ratio is so important. There's some information here on potassium that's really super cool, but we don't have time to talk about it other than to say when a plant is loaded with potassium, one of the things that it does is it creates thicker stems and the way it creates thicker stems is by loading carbohydrates in those thicker stems. And what that does is that when a plant gets into a drought situation, uh, the plant literally, when a, when a plant's in a drought situation, that means it's not photosynthesizing very well because the stomata are closed and we've already gone through how that happens. And so what it relies on during that low photosynthetic period is the carbohydrates in the stems. And of course, thick stems reduce lodging and a whole bunch of other cool shit. And maybe that'll be for another talk another day. And so here's a cell wall, pretty cool picture. But this is the way I think of calcium and boron. If you've got low calcium and low boron, this is what your cell wall looks like. Really easy to penetrate, really easy for people to get through or for uh, stresses to get through it, etc. Here's when your calcium and boron is a little bit better and here's where your calcium and boron is really tight. And so that's kind of the analogy that I use in my head. Obviously this one's going to be a lot harder for something to get in um, and withstand whatever the stress might be. So let's go on to another cascader. We're on to the same actual conversation. Adequate early boron gives you more roots, which increases all of this stuff, including thickening your stem, increasing the uptake of all of these guys. There's a feedback loop here between boron and calcium to be sure. And when things hit the ditch, root growth stops and K leaks back into the soil. And I would guess other stuff leaks back into the soil. And for me, this was kind of a holy shit moment when all of that stuff came together. And this is, this is you know, stuff that kind of blow, blew me away too. And there, I, I oh, sorry, so, sorry about the stumbling, bumbling. I'm obviously excited here this morning. We're looking at soybean growth and the top growth uh, is pretty much identical. You might argue that the low boron plants aren't quite as robust. And what's happening here is this is aquaponic solution, low boron, moderate boron, and adequate boron. And the biggest difference is on the root system. Um, looking at different crops, no boron, positive boron, corn is a little less responsive for whatever reason, especially at this growth stage. But you can see the same effect in all three crops. And then this is the one that blew, absolutely blew me away. Um, we've got alfalfa plants growing in exactly the same amount of boron solution, except that here we're trying to fix it with foliar and here we're fixing it with a root application. Um, this is where the industry pretty much all is. And this is where we need to be. In fact, we probably need to be here plus here in order to optimize our yields in all of our crops. But this is by far the most important, I think. This picture, he had other pictures similar, but this one drives it home. So some of his tidbits, high pH soils tie up boron. So high pH soils need more boron because the boron, even though the soil test might say is adequate, is being tied up. Clay soils need more boron, I think mostly because in clay soils, it's hard for the root systems to explore the soil and find the boron. Uh, his recommendation was that cereals need at least one pound of available boron early and canola might need as much as three or four pounds. And I know there's a few guys in the earth dirt soil uh, community that are playing around with these higher rates and, and getting really good results. and then. Some of the conversation that came out uh, of the dinner before and stuff was 
how do we get our hands on some slow release forms and maybe it would make sense to deep bound some boron with some other nutrients and find some cascading sim sim synergy there as well. So let's, uh, I think this is just a break and move on to the next piece. Oh, a quick snippet about uh, organic matter that's pretty much universal. So with the exception of uh, organic soils, what I'm talking about, peat or muck, those kind of soils, pretty much every mineral soil around the planet will have in its organic matter a ratio of carbon to nitrogen to phosphorus to sulfur to boron that looks like this. So on 1% organic matter, that 1% organic matter is going to contain 11,000 pounds of carbon, 1,000 pounds of organic nitrogen, 200 pounds of organic phosphorus, 100 pounds of organic sulfur, and about one pound of organic boron, and that's because of this ratio up here. So again, I mean, if you're looking at your soil tests or your tissue tests, I guess in this case, your soil tests, um, and you're comparing grandpa's field that's got 5% organic matter compared to grandma's field that's got two. Part of the reason why grandpa's field does better you know, on a regular basis is because it is naturally charged with a lot of different nutrients, some of which became of, become available during the growing season. And this ratio is pretty consistent pretty much all around the planet uh, and on all uh, mineral soils. So a little tidbit about organic matter that most agronomists and farmers don't know. And so now I'm just gonna finish off with the last piece and this is um, uh, the, the piece about cysteine, high levels of sulfur, high levels, levels of cysteine being the, the primary mechanism in helping a plant uh, close off their stomata during peri periods of drought. And the signal comes from the roots and goes to the leaves and the stomata and it's ABBA, not the band, but the hormone. And there it is, abscisic acid. And there's the, the uh, one of the references if you want to look it up. So the roots sense that the plant's running out of water because that's where the water comes from. It sends a signal to the plant leaves uh, using this growth hormone called ABBA. And then with the help of cysteine and probably still potassium and chloride, that stomata closes and turns off the loss of water to the environment. And in the process of doing that, slows down the photosynthetic uh, efficiency of the plant. And then that ties back to what I was talking about earlier with the thickening of stems and the loading of carbohydrates, which then turn into the emergency reserve of energy for the plant so that it can continue to grow aggressively even though it's going through a drought period. I hope that all makes sense. And so I'm just going to show you quickly, uh, you know, the whole bunch of experiments, pretty new stuff. Um, Jack Mack has replicated some of this, no doubt he's a co-author in some of this stuff. But they went through a whole bunch of research with no water stress, the green bars and water stress, the, the gray bars. And the only nutrient that was highly correlated towards um, the way the plants reacted to, uh, what well, reacted to the, to the lack of water. And so we've got water being uh, withheld for seven, 10 and 12 days was sulfate. And then when they dug deeper, they also saw that sulfate and ABBA were correlated in this whole thing. And then when they dug deeper, they found that sulfate, high levels of sulfate in the plant, turn into high levels of cysteine, which turn into these other things that I already talked about before, and all of the stress fighting and everything else they do. And bingo, bo bangi. And all ended up with this graph, which summarizes it all, and that is um, with no sulfate in the system or little sulfate in the system and progressively more, the ability of the plant to close the stomata as tight as possible was a direct result of sulfate. 
through cysteine. So another reason why we should be hammering on more sulfur. And there's the conclusion and I won't go through it because there's a lot of words there and there's a lot of syllables and syllables there and uh, it all amounts to the same thing. When a plant is loaded in sulfur, it's loaded in cysteine and cysteine cooperates with ABBA and potassium to impact rapidly the closing of the stomata. And uh, that's a powerful force when it comes to aiding a plant in resisting drought conditions. And with that, I think, it's a cute picture. With that, um, I think I'm good. I'm sure there's a few questions. Okay, Elston, we got one here from Michael Besser. How much boron can be applied before the remote chance of boron toxicity? And if you broadcast it or spray it, like uh, there's different ways to get at it. So if you broadcast it, you side band it, you, you mid row band it, um, your wallet will get toxic before uh, the, plant, the crops get toxic. If you see if you see place it and you're in a you know a low SBU system, that's where you can run uh, where it can get a little bit risky. So normally in that situation, I think it would be wise to not go over a pound. Mike Delinsky might say even that's crazy, but um, but yeah, the, I, yeah, I think that's a good enough answer. Okay. Um... I'm going to open it up to everybody here um, to see if there's any questions from anybody. And we'll see what everybody's doing. Is there any questions for Elston? The take home message here, guys, is that we need to focus harder on, on boron nutrition. Uh, we need to focus harder on the way we're managing sulfur all across the industry. And so there's some agronomists on the crowd. In the crowd, uh, yeah, you that. that's the take-home message. But yeah, that's, that's what I... Any questions? Well, I obviously either uh, completely put everybody to sleep, and/or I was able to share that information well enough so that there's some take-home messages. Again, there's my email. There's my phone number. Um, the reason I the reason I was put on this planet was to help growers and agronomists and coaches make ever better decisions. Um, and I, you know, I could, I'm more than happy to talk to you guys about almost anything agronomic. And uh, yeah, so don't hesitate. Well, thank you, Austin. It was very informative, and this time went out without a glitch, so we're very happy for that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so everybody stay safe and uh, and uh, hopefully we'll be able to get through this insanity here and get back, get the economy back on its wheels. Thanks, Elson. Have a great day. Yep. Thanks, you guys. All well, you guys too. Cheers.